Two sisters, one a respected TV producer, Jill Blackstone, and the other, Wendy. She was disabled, nearly blind and deaf, and Jill had devoted herself to taking care of Wendy. Jill was her best friend, her sister, her everything. But the sister bond was shattered when Wendy and some of the sisters' rescue dogs were found dead in a garage next to a toppled over barbecue grill. Jill says accidental carbon monoxide poisoning killed everyone. Police do not believe her. Police arrested Jill Blackstone for the murder of her sister. Investigators think it was staged to look like an accident. Who will you believe, especially now that a secret source has come forward with evidence never made public before? Jill was a good producer. There's no doubt about that. But would she produce murder is the question. Season two of Bad Bad Thing, The Blackstone Sisters, available now wherever you get your podcasts. I always say, show me a perfect family. I'll show you a family with secrets. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, always check your candy. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my ravenous co-host, Alice. Hey, Brett, I see what you did there. Ravenous there for go. candy. Mm-hmm. Even though Which you don't really eat candy, knows. but that's okay. Oh, contrary. Oh, it's your my kids, kids that don't eat candy. My you kids are not allowed to candy. eat candy. I eat all their candy. I eat a ton of candy. I eat a ton of gummy bears and a lot of chocolate. Really anything that's sweet. But no, you're right. I'm that monster who doesn't let my kids eat candy. Partly, honestly, because of the story we're going to talk about today. I think this has made every parent's nightmares with regard to candy during trick-or-treating. You know, Alice, you can't live your life in fear. I know we're here at this this time of, of horror and Halloween, but you got to be bold. got to be brave. got to eat your candy but you probably should check your candy. And look, if you guys wanted a horrific story for Halloween, this one is absolutely horrific. It's one of those stories that it is unbelievable, the depths of man's depravity. And this is one that's going to take us all the way down to the very bottom. It is hard to describe. It is hard to imagine a worse story than the one we're going to tell today. You know, when I saw Brett at the pool earlier today, and this is September when we're recording, so it's still hot, I literally said to him, I was like, this is the worst story ever. I don't want to record tonight because it makes me so sad whenever we talk about stories like this, and you're about to know what we're talking about. So I don't think we should preface this anymore. I think people are dying for these October episodes, Brett. Well, you know, I certainly hope so. I am curious, Alice, you know, you come from a different culture, as child of immigrants. You've talked a lot about how the fact you didn't speak English until you were in grade school. I'm curious, when you were growing up, was trick-or-treating something that you did with your family or was that something you kind of missed out on? Absolutely went trick-or-treating, but not with my family, with like friends from school. And I absolutely did because I did come from an immigrant household that was like, Free stuff? Yes, we're absolutely going to go get it. <laughs> any other immigrants out there? Like anything free? It was like, you don't need this, but you're going to take it. Like a koozie? Yes, I'll take it. Absolutely. Free candy? Absolutely. I'll take it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, trick-or-treating was obviously something that we did a lot of. And I remember, I can remember, the funny thing, I feel like growing up in the 80s was sort of an interesting experience. Those of you out there who grew up in the 80s, we, we grew up in a time, it was like the perfect 
mix of communication and everybody being connected, but not so much that you could easily check things to see whether or not they were true. So the whole like 80s and early 90s, you had the satanic panic. You had sort of Dungeons and Dragons as, you know, destroying the minds of children. You had a lot of urban legends like that people were putting razor blades in candy or that candy was poisoned to the extent that a lot of parents wouldn't let their kids go trick-or-treating. It became, you know, sort of a, a, instead of a fun, happy Halloween experience, it was something to be feared. You had, they would run commercials on the television about this, like public service announcements to make sure that you always checked your candy because you never knew what was going to happen. And hundreds of children every year were being injured or even killed by candy and there were you know growing up in the in the south we had a lot of sort of hyper religious stuff and there was were all these stories about satanists and that satanists used halloween to sacrifice children to their dark gods and one way they would do it was through using poison candy and and this was sort of the environment that you grew up with and and you know Maybe that continued into the 90s and 2000s, but in the 80s, it definitely was present. And one of the reasons, I think, is the case that we're going to talk about today. So with that, let's talk about the reality behind this urban legend. Before we get started, though, one other thing that I should mention, because as we did last year, we're going to be watching horror movies. And by we, I mean me and you, not Alice, who will not be joining us. I'll be watching rom-coms on a separate Twitter thread. (laughs) And our, our selected movie for this week is Trick or Treat which is one of the best Halloween movies ever made. I watch it every year and checking your candy is part of that movie. So I think it's, I think it fits in perfectly with what we're doing and the way we're going to do it this year. Last year, we tried to watch them on Tuesday night because our episodes come out early Tuesday morning, but I think I'm going to move it to Friday this time. So if you're listening to this on the first week in October on Tuesday, this Friday, I'll be on Twitter I'm going to watch this movie. I don't really care if anybody joins me, but I would love to have you along. So if you join me on Twitter, we will tweet about the movie and watch it together. And I will try and find a place for you to get it. Once the, when the hour arrives, I will tweet out some hopefully free places that you can watch it. We did that last year and we had a lot of fun and we'll start it around probably eight o'clock central time. So do your, you got to do your conversions. We'll do 8.30 just to make sure my kids are in bed because I don't want to scare them with all these dark horror movies. So 8.30 this Friday. Join me on Twitter. We're going to watch Trick or Treat. It's an amazing movie. If you had not seen it, you're absolutely going to love it. So with that, anything else you want to say, Alice, before we go ahead and start? No, I hope you have fun watching the movie <laughs> without me. I will not be watching. I know you on Alice. Maybe one day. Well, this story takes us all the way back to Halloween night, October 31st, 1974. And it is a harrowing Halloween tale that sounds like something out of a horror movie or one of those urban legends we've talked about. Poisoned pixie sticks and the tragic death of an eight-year-old boy who led locals to dub the monster we're going to talk about Today, the man who killed Halloween. And this man, his name is Ronald Clark O'Brien, and he appeared to everyone as your typical American family man. He was a Texas native who has been described by various programs that have covered this as a, quote, good Christian man and an above average father. Above average, you know, that's what a lot of us shoot for. And that's what he was. He was he wasn't It's great. not exactly the, the thing you put on like a, a tombstone, <laughs> yeah. but I do like that it's above average, not just average, not below average, but, but above average, not stellar. Yeah. Clearly he, not stellar. Clearly not stellar. And he's going to show that even above average was, was far too, far too great uh, an honor to bestow upon him. And he was actually born in October, October 19th, 1944. After marrying his wife, Deneen, the couple bought a home in Deer Park, Texas, where they welcomed two children, Timothy in 1966 and Elizabeth in 1969. By 1974, Ronald was working as an optician and in his spare time acted as a deacon at the Second Baptist Church, where he also led a bus program and sang in the choir. Life for the O'Brien family was good 
or so it seemed. Everything seems perfect. We talk about this a lot. In a lot of these cases, particularly when you see some sort of family dynamic, everything seems perfect until it's not. You have that sort of, you know, obviously in the 1960s, they didn't have Facebook, but it's that, that idea, right? The perfect Facebook Live. You are projecting to the community, to your friends, to the people in the church, that everything is fine, everything is wonderful. And it's this kind of situation that always leads people to say, I never saw it coming. He was amazing. I can't, he's the last person I would suspect. And yet there are often things bubbling up below the surface. And it's so interesting in this case, you know, it's not only perfect to the outside world, they're very connected to the outside world. You know, this is not an insular family who shut their doors and no one could see inside their homes. Being a deacon at a church, especially, you know, what, the Second Baptist Church in Texas is going to be one of your big churches that a lot of people go to. It's going to, you know, draw a lot of the community members and deacons are really in, in terms of social hierarchy relatively high. And so this is not a shutaway family. This is one pretty much living out in the community. And that's a really good point. And Alice is from Texas and she knows this well. And I'm my understanding is Texas is a lot like Alabama. Everybody typically goes to church. Church is a huge part of the community. Being a leader in your church is really important. It's something people aspire to. And look, I mean he he appears to be sort of the perfect father and head of a family. And and I'll say this we're going to talk about some really bad things. To my knowledge, and in looking into this case, I didn't see anything that during this whole period, you know, he's super abusive or anything. I mean, there were there were problems in this family, and we're going to get to those. But it seems like the problems weren't so much, you know, that he really was a monster at home and he was really sadistic or anything like that. There were other things that are going to come in that that show you that this facade is just that. It's a facade. And so, as you can probably tell where this conversation's going, in actuality, this was little more than an elaborate facade. Ronald had been fired from 21 jobs over the past 10 years and was on the fast track to losing another after being accused of stealing from his current employer, Texas State Optical. His inability to hold down a job resulted in serious financial trouble for the O'Briens. Ronald was more than $100,000 in debt and had already defaulted on several loans. He had been forced to sell their Deer Park home and move the family into an apartment in a less desirable area. And now his car was on the verge of getting repossessed. In a desperate attempt to solve the financial problems he created, Ronald devised a sickening plan to get some quick cash a life insurance scheme in which his own children were the targets. And we're going to go through this scheme and talk about it. But one thing I, I want you to pay attention to is, is how ham-fisted, poorly planned, and obvious this was. Because, and we talk about this a lot, there is this thought out there that killers are, you know, they're like in the movies where for the first hour and a half of the movie, the killer is so devious and so smart. The police can't figure it out. Are they ever going to catch a break? And then finally something gives and they're able to unravel his dastardly plan. But in reality, most criminals are, I mean, idiots is probably a strong, <laughs> strong word, but they are, their plans are not super sophisticated and their motives are not what you as a good, decent human being would expect. And just because, you know, when you're looking at other cases, if you see other cases and you see someone do something and it seems like a really stupid thing to do, that is not evidence of their innocence. <laughs> That's not like, well, if he really did it, he probably wouldn't do that. No, people do that kind of stuff all the time. You think back to the Murdoch case and some of the the mistakes that Murdoch, who was a very smart guy, who was cunning, who had deceived people for decades, and yet he's making some very basic mistakes that came back to haunt him. This case takes the cake for basic <laughs> mistakes, but it definitely proves that just because you decide to kill someone and just because you plan it doesn't mean it's going to be a good plan. Yeah, and this, I mean, you guys are about to hear the timeline, and this case is like the classic life insurance fraud kind of case. It, you could not write a more clear case of life insurance fraud. And it's just so sad because in this case, the targets, like we said, are his own small children. So this starts in January of 1974. By this point, as Alice had said, O'Brien is, he's facing a lot of debt. He's facing a lot of problems. And so he takes out a $10,000 life insurance policy on each of his children. 
as most of you probably know, life insurance policies on your children, particularly for that much, which remember, we're here in 2023. This is back in 1974. That's a lot of money. And it's only going to turn into more money. Usually with life insurance policies for children, if you even have them, they're, they're something like, you know, funeral coverage, that kind of thing, where God forbid, if anything happens, they can cover that kind of stuff. But taking out large life insurance policies on children is actually pretty rare. Usually life insurance is essentially to replace lost income and children typically, thankfully, tend to live to adulthood. So it's not a very good quote unquote investment either to take out a life insurance policy on your child. Doesn't mean people don't do it. Not criticizing you if you're out there and you did do it, but a $10,000 policy on both children in 1974, that's a lot of money. And it's in particular, it's a lot of money for someone with money problems. Generally speaking, when you don't have a lot of money, you're not throwing it away on things that you don't really need to be spending money on. And in this case, a life insurance policy on your children is quite a, a luxury and not the kind of money that you would expect him to have unless he has some sort of ulterior motive behind it. But that's not it. $10,000 wasn't going to be enough for what he needed. In September of 1974, he takes out an additional $20,000 policy on each of his children. So now, on both kids, he has $60,000 of life insurance coverage. Adjusted for inflation, that is nearly $400,000 today. That's a lot of life insurance, particularly on children. And, you know, one thing that's interesting about life insurance policies and life insurance companies, life insurance companies often actually have pretty good investigators who work for them because they're always looking out for fraud. If you've read the book, The Furious Hours, it's a great book. If you haven't checked it out, it's about Harper Lee. After she wrote To Kelly Mockingbird, she actually got into true crime, strangely enough, in part because of her friendship with Truman Capote, who wrote one of the first true crime books, the first true crime book I ever read. In Cold Blood, which really started me down the true crime path. So if you haven't read In Cold Blood, definitely read it. It's great. And she was looking for a similar story. She wanted to do an investigation into a murder. She wanted to write a book. She got really involved in this murder of a preacher in Alabama who was actually a murderer himself. And he would take out life insurance policies on people, even people he wasn't related to, make himself the beneficiary, kill the people, and then collect the money. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff about how the life insurance industry developed to start to look skeptically at these kind of policies because they kept having to pay them out and how they started investigating these murders, even when the police weren't to show, to prove that they were murders and therefore not have to pay them out. This is an aside, but obviously life insurance is important in this case. And this is a lot of money to take out on children. And I wonder if the life insurance company itself, if any red flags were going up at headquarters when they saw all this money being taken out on children. You know, so these kids at this point are, what, five and eight years old, so very, very young. And remember, with life insurance, there's also usually like a pre-existing illness requirement, right? So if your child is five years old, it's kind of strange to take out a life insurance policy because their life expectancy is, what, 70 plus years? And if that child had, say, a terminal illness, that's going to be a very expensive life insurance policy. There is no terminal illness that we know of here. And certainly the life insurance company did not have a life insurance policy for terminally ill children. All this to say is you're right about that, Brett. The marketplace speaks because I received multiple kind of whistleblower cases from the private sector investigating kind of these types of frauds because they were the insurance company had to pay out when they didn't want to pay out and they suspected fraud, but they don't have the prosecuting power of the government. And so they would refer a lot of these cases for investigation. And so I, I read through many of these files and it was really interesting because these companies obviously have their own bottom line money at stake. And so they put together these incredible case files that obviously would benefit them because if fraud was caught, they wouldn't have to be paying out. But it was amazing to see kind of file after file from these insurance companies. Not all of them panned out to be fraud, but and not all of them were fraud through murder either. So, you know, there's there's that angle as well. But it is very interesting when you have like a marketplace like life insurance and how that plays into criminal conduct. 
So that brings us to October 31st, 1974. By this point, $60,000 in life insurance is on the table. And O'Brien calls his insurance agency. I'm sure this was just a coincidence. He had some questions about how he would go about collecting on that insurance policy should anything happen to his children. That call happened at around 9 a.m. the morning of Halloween. So, Halloween, the day that most kids are very excited to dress up and go trick-or-treating and get some free candy. Nothing was different for the O'Briens' home. In the early evening, the O'Briens are having the early dinner with their friends, the Bates family, at the Bates' home in Pasadena, Texas. The two families had previously been neighbors, and this was a chance for everyone to get together again following the O'Briens' recent move. After dinner... Ronald Clark O'Brien takes his two children, Timothy O'Brien and Elizabeth O'Brien, trick-or-treating in Pasadena. And he's accompanied by his friend, Jim Bates, and Jim's two children. The group knocked on the door of one home without any lights on. After receiving no answer, the children moved along to the next house. And you should note, these kids are pretty small. You know, his kids are five and eight. Those of us who've gone uh, trick-or-treating with young children, you know that walking long distances is not a fun activity with small children. So they don't hit a ton of houses. And I think this was even a drizzly night. It's not the greatest night for trick-or-treating, but that's not going to deter kids who really want free candy. But this home does stick out because no one answers the door. The group moves on, but Ronald actually stayed back to try knocking again. A short while later, he rejoined the group with five 21-inch pixie sticks, a Halloween favorite. I remembered eating pixie sticks as a child. Really, it's just pure sugar with like a little bit of food coloring in it. I love pixie sticks. I would take them. After this story. (laughs) I would take them and get like a little plate and just pour them all out on the plate and have like a big pile of them. And then, like, I mean, you snort them like cocaine, basically. I mean, not through my nose, obviously, but just, like, suck it all up. (laughs) So I love them. I love Pixie Sticks so much. Do you still like Pixie Sticks as an adult? I still like Pixie Sticks. Oh, yeah. It it really is just pure sugar. Okay. I mean, truly, those of you who may not be listening in the United States and may not have heard of Pixie Sticks, which I think is the brand name of it, it's like a straw, really a plastic straw. I guess there's paper ones, too. Paper or plastic. And it's filled with sugar. And they're ostensibly different flavors. Like the purple sugar is grape. The red flavor is cherry. But it's all just straight sugar. Some like tanginess. It has has flavor. But the point is it's little grains of sugar and it's not disguised. It really is just little grains of sugar. And usually it's like either stapled or taped at the top. And you like, I remember this as a child, you like rip off the top with with your mouth because it was typically like paper. And then you just like guzzle it straight sugar and you usually pour the whole straw worth of sugar straight into your mouth so he comes up with these five pixie sticks and ronald told the kids that someone was home after all and handed a pixie stick to each of the four children he would later give the last remaining pixie stick to a boy in the neighborhood that he recognized from church so overall all these five pixie sticks were distributed to kids two of whom were his own children. And, you know, when you know what's going to happen, this is the just the amount of evil involved in this action to have these five pixie sticks, to give them to your own children, your friend's children, and then just a random child from your church. That you <laughs> recognize is, from your church. Not even yeah. a purely random child. Yeah, it is... It's amazing. And we'll we'll continue. For those of you who don't who are not familiar with this story, we'll continue so you can so you can see just how evil this is. So they continue their trick or treating. They don't eat the pixie sticks at the time. They go around the houses, they're collecting their haul. I believe Timothy, Ronald's son, I think he was dressed as a skeleton that night. So the night wraps up and Ronald says to his kids, each of them can have one treat before bed and he suggests the pixie sticks well his daughter elizabeth didn't want anything she didn't want anything to eat so she refused the pixie stick but timothy his son is all about it he goes straight for the pixie stick now this was 
As Alice said, ordinarily these would be sealed, but this pixie stick had been opened and then had been stapled at the top. So they took out the staple, which reopens the pixie stick, and they noticed that the sugar inside, as Alice said, it's just these little grains of sugar, is all clumped up. So it's not the sort of free-flowing grains of sugar that you would expect in a pixie stick. But whatever, who cares? Timothy goes ahead and eats the pixie stick. He immediately complains that it tastes bitter. But his dad tells him, probably no problem. He gives him some Kool-Aid to wash down the rest of the pixie stick. Well, it did not take long, minutes, before Timothy started crying out in pain. At this point, he starts to convulse. He is vomiting and gasping, foaming at the mouth, until his body suddenly goes limp in his father's arms. He will be dead before he even makes it to the hospital, having been pronounced dead on arrival at 10.30 p.m. Probably comes as a surprise to none of you that after an autopsy was performed, the medical examiner, Dr. Joseph A. Jakominski, determined that his cause of death was cyanide poisoning. And he had, in fact, consumed enough cyanide to kill two to three grown men. So the police respond to this, and they are freaking out. This sounds to them like someone has poisoned the candy that the children have gotten with cyanide. They are rushing to the homes of the other children. They go to the Bates house. Remember, these were the friends of Ronald's that had gone with him. Fortunately, neither of the children had consumed the pixie sticks since their parents didn't want sugar getting all over the floor. Those pixie sticks also contained cyanide. The last remaining pixie stick had been given to Whitney Parker. Whitney Parker, as we said, was a child that Ronald recognized from church. The boy's parents found Whitney in his bed, the candy still clutched in his hand. Fortunately, he had tried to get into the, to the packaging to eat the pixie stick, but by some miracle, he had not been able to get it open and actually fell asleep trying with the pixie stick clutched in his hand. That pixie stick also contained cyanide. Had he been able to get into it, he would have died as well. So as tragic a story as this is, and as tragic a story as the death of Timothy is, all five children were very, very close to dying, and it was only by the whim of fate that four of them survived. I mean, as a parent, the image of Whitney, of his parents running into his room with him clutching the unopened pixie stick brought me to tears. I mean, truly brought me to tears, but, you know, but for like the intervention of a greater power, he would have gotten into that pixie stick because I mean, like can you, you imagine all said, walking in and I, seeing him with it in his hand? In his I would bed? think he already ate it. Exactly. I would think that he's already dead is yeah. what I would think as a, <laughs> as a parent, but thank, I mean, truly thank God this was not a quintuple murder, but there was enough cyanide to kill all of these five children multiple times over. And Mm, going back to why Timothy ate that particular pixie stick, his dad urged him, urged both of them to eat candy that night. And not just any candy, but a pixie stick. And just because Elizabeth, a five-year-old, perhaps she just had stronger opinions. I don't know many kids who would turn down sugar. Again, incredible that she chose not to eat the candy. It is not surprising to me that Timothy ate candy at his father's urging. Usually parents are telling you not to eat candy before bed, not the opposite. You wouldn't turn that kind of opportunity down. And the fact that he passed away so quickly, it must have been an incredibly painful death with the amount of cyanide that was in that pixie stick. I mean, this is not a go quietly in your sleep sort of murder. This was a horrific, no chances taken it will absolutely kill your child. And this, he was making sure his child ate, ate the candy immediately and it was going to be painful and there was going to be no coming back from it. They couldn't get to him fast enough. No one could have pumped his stomach fast enough for him to live. Yeah, the advantage of cyanide is that it definitely will kill you. The disadvantage is it is not a pleasant way to go. And, you know, yeah, it's just... It is, it is amazing. It is amazing that anyone 
would would stoop to this level. But at this point, all the authorities know is a horrible tragedy has occurred and one that mirrored the fears of parents across the country. And every dark story that anyone had told about Halloween suddenly is coming true. And as horrible as Halloween night was, I think what happens next is so incredibly heartless. The very next morning on November 1st, just mere hours after Timothy died, Ronald O'Brien called the insurance agency to collect the payout associated with Timothy's death. Later that morning, O'Brien escorted police along the route they had walked for Halloween. But he said, conveniently, he was unable to remember what house he got the pixie sticks from. He told police that he never saw the face of the person. And what had happened was that an arm had just emerged from a doorway and handed him the five pixie sticks. And look, I mean, this is like a bad horror movie, right? The darkened house. The kids are all trick-or-treating. The darkened house. You can imagine as they're looking on it, there's sort of ominous music and he goes up and knocks on the door and, and nobody answers and maybe he's even turning around to leave and suddenly the door opens but there's no light from the inside and a hand reaches out with the pixie sticks and he takes them i mean the story he is telling is is cliche it's an urban legend i mean it, it sounds like, like an urban legend even if this exact story hadn't existed before november 31st 1974 it's told as if a, it was an urban legend you can absolutely see this and understand what's happening, especially in the midst of the panic that you were talking about at this time. And Timothy's death was so sudden, so devastating, and he is laid to rest on November 2nd, 1974 at Forest Park Cemetery. O'Brien sang a hymn for the funeral, which brought the crowd to tears. At this point, everyone just is feeling for the O'Briens, right? They are feeling for Ronald. He's just lost his young son to this horrendous unimaginable horror from Halloween, which should have been a joyous evening of candy and frivolity, but instead turned into a devastating loss of his son. But some people at the funeral felt that something was off, and several attendees thought that O'Brien was acting strangely. Jim Bates noted that Ronald seemed oblivious to his son's casket, even walking into it at times as if he couldn't see, you know, his dead son's casket right in front of him. Some family members recall that Ronald became irate when they did not want to stay up late and watch a TV broadcast performance of the song he had performed for Timothy. Obviously, we talk a lot about behavioral analysis and how everyone reacts differently in very stressful situations. I would absolutely put losing your eight-year-old son in that category of I have no idea how you would respond. And I think everyone would, would respond differently. So a lot of this may be post hoc. People are like, you know, I did think that was a little bit weird that he was acting that way. Someone who's innocent may be acting that way because they're in such utter shock that their child is gone. But it is strange that, you know, he takes center stage in his son's funeral by singing the hymn that is, you know, bringing everyone to tears. And that's not enough. It's clearly the song, at least in this retelling of it, is not for his dead son. Seems like it's still about him because he wants to then watch the hymn that he sang and wants other people to enjoy watching him on, you know, the news afterwards about what a great song he sang. Which is perfectly consistent with the kind of person that he turns out to be. The next couple days, November 3rd and 4th, it's only been a few days after the death of Timothy, but the police are starting to grow suspicious and frustrated with Ronald. It seems like he is absolutely incapable of helping them find the person who killed his son and tried to kill four other children. So they say, let's go for another walk along the trick-or-treating route and see if this time anything sparks your memory. Miraculously, Ronald's memory does return to him, and he is able to point officers directly to the home that gave him the poisoned pixie stick. At the time, the owner, Courtney Mellon, was sitting on his front porch, and the police quickly zoomed in on him as their chief suspect. On November the 4th, they actually arrested him in front of all his co-workers at William P. Hobby Airport in Houston. And I gotta say... 
probably not the the most shining moment for the police <laughs> when they arrested this guy. I mean, I realized it was probably very difficult to believe that Ronald had anything to do with this, but I think maybe arresting Mellon might not have been a little aggressive on the part of the police, but they do so. They arrest him, they take him in, and they interrogate him. But unfortunately for Ronald, he ends up having an airtight alibi. In fact, he had been working at the airport the night of Halloween and had not been home that night, which was confirmed by timesheets, which, as we know, are always the essential element of any good alibi, and his colleagues. So barring any kind of conspiracy theories anyone wants to launch about Mr. Mellon, he was eliminated as a suspect in these murders. Guys, we are so excited to welcome Noom to the prosecutor's family. You know the problem with fads. They come and go. So when it comes to weight management plans, you need a long-term solution, and that's Noom. Noom uses science and personalization so you can manage your weight for the long term. Noom's psychology-based approach helps you build better habits and behaviors that are easier to maintain. The best part, you decide how Noom fits into your life, not the other way around. Based on a sample of 4,272 Noomers, 98% say Noom helps change their habits and behaviors for good. Brett, you know, these diets, fads just don't work for me, which is why I'm so glad that Noom helps you understand the science behind your eating choices and why you have those cravings. Noom's personalized courses are easy to follow and will help grow your confidence with tools you can put into practice on the very first day. And they'll give you the knowledge and wisdom you need to make informed choices about what you eat. Noom's really changing how the world thinks about weight loss. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M.com to sign up for your trial today. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to us talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year. So you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Guys, we've talked about Earth Breeze a lot. It is a product we love, and we are so happy to use it. You know, I thought recycling was making a big difference until I learned this. Now, hear me out. You know those recycling symbols on plastic containers. The technical term is resin identification numbers, and they can be misleading. Did you know that this doesn't always mean the plastic will get recycled? In fact, 91% of plastic doesn't even get recycled. And you know what I'm talking about right now, those massive jugs of detergent. And that's one reason we love Earth Breeze Eco Sheets. Earth Breeze makes a revolutionary liquidless detergent that looks just like a dryer sheet and gets your clothes clean. Brett, with three kids now, I feel like I'm always doing laundry and I need good stain fighting detergent. And that's exactly what Earth Breeze gives me. They have thought of everything. The packaging is lightweight. It's a cardboard envelope, saving not only space, but avoiding that plastic jug. And Earth Breeze is compatible with my high efficiency washer, gray water systems, and is septic safe. And this is the best, especially with little kids. Their eco sheets are hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested and it dissolves in any wash cycle, hot 
or cold. This is low maintenance detergent, exactly what I need. Over 2 million Americans have made a difference by choosing EarthBreeze. They have over 40,000 five-star reviews. The switch is easy. EarthBreeze offers a satisfaction guarantee. If it's not for you, they'll give you a full refund. No questions asked. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors. That's earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take. Whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality, it can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do or it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving Moving, installations, or cleaning, Angie is there for you, and they're there for you with confidence. So, Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or, they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps because when it comes to getting the most out of your home you can do this when you angie that download the free angie mobile app today or visit angie.com that's a-n-g-i.com check them out today angie.com a-n-g-i.com and you know it- can very good for him. He works at a very busy place. It's not like he works in a one man, you know, cubicle, it, you know, on Halloween night. He works at the airport where there are a lot of people who see him. I think there's something like what a couple hundred people who actually confirm seeing him at work. And so his alibi was backed up not only by his timesheet, but a bunch of eyewitnesses were like, yeah, he was absolutely at work. And side note, Hobby Airport is like one of my favorite airports in the whole United States. It's just such a great airport. So convenient. But to note about Hobby Airport, it is not a huge airport at all. It's a very, very small airport. In 1974, it was probably smaller, meaning that it's almost like a small community. Mellon wouldn't just fade into the background. People would absolutely know he was there, and they did. So, yeah, the police did a little bit of a mistake here when they arrested him. But you can understand why they were doing this. They are panicking. They're four days out of timothy being murdered and four other small children could have been murdered they don't know what else is out there if this person's going to strike again if those were the only pixie sticks if there's more pixie sticks if he poisoned snicker bars who knows what this monster has done so you know they were completely wrong in arresting him especially in such a public manner but it puts you into where the police were they were panicking trying to figure out what this was hoping to prevent more deaths but at this point with ronald having fingered the wrong guy the police are pretty certain about who did this and the next day november 5th 1974 they arrest him for the murder of his son they charge him with one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder and in those days even though they went ahead and arrested Mellon, in those days between halloween they had actually uncovered a mountain of circumstantial evidence against Ronald. They discovered those financial problems we talked about, and they learned about the multiple life insurance policies taken out against his children. And they also learned that he was very interested in how those life insurance policies paid out. They knew that Ronald was the one who had given the pixie sticks to his children, and when asked to confirm who gave him the candy, at first he couldn't recall the house, and then all of a sudden he's pointing to a house of a man with a rock-solid alibi they found a piece of adding machine tape on which ronald had written out a list of his bills the amounts of which were almost exactly what he stood to gain from the life insurance payouts during a search of his home investigators found a quote pair of scissors with plastic residue attached which were similar to that found on the cyanide laced pixie sticks as we said the pixie sticks were already open someone had already cut them open And here the police are finding the pair of scissors that were used to do that. 
Ronald was also taking classes at a local community college and in what I guess is sort of a 1970s version of Google, he asks his professor questions like, what's more lethal, cyanide or another type of poison? An interesting question someone might ask before a family member suddenly dies of poisoning. The police were able to nail down that Ronald had looked into purchasing cyanide and had inquired with several chemical companies about how to get his hands on it. And in what always seals the deal for the police, whether it's admissible or not, and whether we agree with it or not, he failed a polygraph test. So in the eyes of the police, they knew exactly who did this. It wasn't a bunch of Satanist with poison pixie sticks. It wasn't a neighbor who wanted to take out his frustrations out on children it was the father of the victim. Which I can imagine the police don't even want to believe, just like we don't want to believe can be possible, this level of depravity. And Ronald does not, he does not go down easy. He doesn't put down his head in sorrow and admit that he's been wrong, that he was the murderer. He, in fact, goes to trial. And on May 5th, 1975, that's just what happens. His trial begins. He entered a not guilty plea claiming that someone had given him the candy and he was unaware they were poisoned. On June 3rd, 1975, so this is a long trial. This is a, a month-long trial of probably just horrendous hor the entire tone of the trial must have just been horrendous when you have the murder of a small child and that small child is the defendant's own child and the jury wasn't buying what ronald was saying about his innocence because after the conclusion of trial they deliberated for just 46 minutes before the jury returned a guilty verdict on all five charges one charge of capital murder, and four counts of attempted murder. 71 minutes later, so just a little bit longer than what they deliberated for guilt or innocence or guilt or acquittal, the jury sentenced Ronald to death by electric chair. Those of you who may not know, Texas does have the death penalty. And in this instance, the jury was the one to determine whether the death penalty applied. And they apparently had not a lot of problems in saying, yes, it should. On September 26th, 1979, Ronald would appeal his conviction several times, but his conviction and penalty were upheld by eight state and federal courts over the span of nine years. A lot of you have heard us talk about the appeals process, especially for death penalty cases every Really, every type of appeal is is available for death penalty. We want to make sure we get it right. Obviously, it is the ultimate punishment. And this just shows you how long the process takes. Ronald took advantage of every single appeal. He appeared before eight different courts in the state and federal systems with his appeal to overturn his conviction and overturn his sentence of the death penalty. And all eight courts said no. The district court, the jury's verdict stands here. And it took almost 10 years after the trial. And if there ever was a case where someone deserved the death penalty, it is this one. And on March 31st, 1984, that sentence was carried out. Although he was initially sentenced to death by electric chair in 1977, Texas had adopted lethal injection. And on that date, O'Brien was executed by lethal injection. Now, <laughs> even up until the last moment, he maintained his innocence until the very end, which just goes to show you, we talk about this sometimes, people sometimes just assume that eventually murderers will confess. You know, they will admit what they did and the fact that they maintain their innocence to the very end is that maybe they are innocent. Well, this guy was not innocent and he maintained his innocence until the very end refusing to take responsibility for his son's death, even as they were slipping the needle into his arm. And if you don't like him up to this point, you're going to like him even less after I read you his final words. This is what he had to say right before he was executed for murdering his son. What is about to transpire in a few moments is wrong. However, we as human beings do make mistakes and errors. This execution is one of those wrongs, yet doesn't mean our whole system of justice is wrong. Therefore, I would forgive all who have taken part in any way in my death. 
Also, to anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years, I pray and ask your forgiveness, just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. And I pray and ask God's forgiveness for all of us, respectively, as human beings. To my loved ones, I extend my undying love. To those close to me, know in your hearts I love you, one and all. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. Ronald C. O'Brien. P.S. During my time here, I have been treated well by all TDC personnel. So those were his last words, even until the end, not accepting responsibility for what he had done to his own children. You know, what's what really hits me about that last statement of his is he asks for the forgiveness of everyone in his life that he's ever offended, but not his son, right? The one he brutally murdered. And I mean, that entire statement sounds just dripping with self-attention and falsehood because of that one point that he cannot say that he killed his own child. There's absolutely no remorse there in his life. Everything is kind of generalities. Oh, anyone who I've offended, please forgive me. May God's blessing be upon you. I mean, he's speaking as if he were giving a sermon as a deacon at his Second Baptist Church. And those of you out there who are parents, you recognize something about Ronald. If you gave your child accidentally through no fault of your own, If you gave your child the piece of candy that was poisoned and killed them, it would not matter that you had nothing to do with it. You would blame yourself for the rest of your life. You would question it. You would live it again and again and again. And you would feel so much guilt for that, even if you didn't poison it. And at no point does he show any any guilt or remorse for what happened, even if he's completely innocent, which he's not. And it is striking to me that there's the level of depravity in this man. I mean, he is, he is, as we often say on the podcast, a lot of people who do monstrous things aren't monsters. This man was a monster. That's a really fair point because I hate child killers. I hate parents who kill their children. And in some ways, I'm glad that I cannot relate to this man at all. And I do think he is just absolutely a monster because it makes me feel like maybe there are few parents like that out there. So on this night, a crowd of nearly 300 people were gathered outside of the Texas State Penitentiary for the execution, shouting cheers of trick or treat and throwing candy into the air. At 12.38 a.m., after nearly a decade, the man that had come to be called the candy man and the man who killed Halloween was dead. You know, in some ways, obviously, this story touched so many people because of just the horrendous facts. But these executions usually happen very close to midnight because there's usually appeals up until the last moment. There's usually an order from the governor of when you can execute a person. So it has to be that day, which is why his time of death is about 1238. And I, I note that because This is very, very late at night. These penitentiaries where the death penalty is, is, you know, given is in the middle of nowhere. Yet 300 people drove out to the middle of nowhere at midnight, essentially, and probably stood around for hours because executions do take a long time, waited to see Timothy be vindicated is like a morsel of a silver lining for this child whose own father didn't care enough to ask his forgiveness or to ever admit what he had done. But 300 people and many, many more around the nation and now, you know, many, many years later, we're hearing his story again, do hold Timothy in their hearts. And thank God for that, because as much as we've been talking about this monster, what is so devastating about the story is that Timothy at eight year old lost his life for something as stupid as his own father's financial improprieties, right? He didn't do anything wrong (laughs) at all. He literally lived and his life was worth money because his dad put money on his life and then took him out in order to pay off his own debts. And I just want to say again, because the longer I do true crime, the more surprised I am at the people who listen to true crime. Because I would think when I started doing death penalty litigation, And seeing why people kill people, it was a real eye-opener for me because I came to realize that people murder people for nothing, just nothing. And I'm always surprised by the people who listen to true crime, who who pay a lot of attention to true crime, who have a hard time believing any motive. (laughs) Because when you learn about these stories, you just learn at how terrible people can be. And we keep going back to Murdoch. 
because people just didn't couldn't believe that Alec Murdoch would kill his child over money. That's crazy. It's just money. Why would he do that? And it's like people do it all the time and it's terrible and it's horrible and it's a horrible thing to say. But this is the ultimate of that. Like Alice said, that was the only reason he did this. It was a pure financial tra transaction. As somebody in the chat said, if he didn't have money problems, you know, he wouldn't even have done this. It was just, it was just a practical thing. Like, oh, you know, I'm, I need some money. What's a good way to get money? Oh, I'll kill my son. I mean, that's essentially what he did with that level of emotion. And look, I am both never surprised by why people kill people and always shocked. Somehow I have both of them in my mind. Like, I can't believe someone would do that on the one hand, but on the other, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing people do. And you see that in this case. Absolutely. So there is, I have to like take a moment because it's just so sad. But as you can tell, this has probably spurred a lot of urban legends. And a lot of you, I know, may be thinking, I'm never letting my kids go trick-or-treating or I'm never going to let them eat candy, even though you now know th this story, as horrible as it was, wasn't some random evil person sitting in their home reaching their hands out to poison kids. This was a father doing it to his own child and tried to do it to his friend's children and then someone he knew from church as well. But though it might be hard to believe, this is not the case that started the poisoned candy hysteria. That was already a real concern for parents and really, I would say Ronald just capitalized on this concern. It's believed that O'Brien was, you know, channeling this fear when he came up with his master plan to cancel his debts. Prior to this point, there really weren't any documented instances of poisoned Halloween candy, at least to this extent. But there was so much allure around it that many people believed this was happening all over the country. So take that into consideration. Everyone thought this was happening. Parents were panicking all over the nation. It was probably talked about on the news. It was the stuff of urban legends and movies and books. But there was not a single documented instance of it until the O'Brien case. And, you know, before the O'Brien case, it was such a panicking event, despite the lack of evidence. I want you to note this, that even the New York Times issued a warning about it without it ever having been a real case. This is just one of those things where I'm like, watch what you read. Be careful what you think is supposed to be panic inducing. And I unfortunately think Ronald you know, seized on it. And the police clearly were acting on that type of panic when they arrested Mellon because everyone was hysterical. The New York Times had issued a warning before the O'Brien case had happened. And now this was every parent's worst nightmare. We have to catch this monster. And also this might be happening all over the nation, but it wasn't. And although there was no documented deaths by candy, O'Brien wasn't the first to do something like this unfortunately. In 1964, 10 years earlier in Long Island, a woman named Helen File handed out poison ant traps as candy that contained arsenic. Now, it wouldn't have killed anyone, but it would have made them very sick. She also gave kids dog biscuits and steel wool. She would say that she did it as a joke to get back at older kids who were trick-or-treating, but it sounds terrible, right? Like, none of those things would have killed anyone. The arsenic would have made you really, really sick. The dog biscuits and the steel wool, like a really terrible trick, not funny at all. And ultimately, law enforcement agreed. She was charged with child endangerment and given two years suspended, meaning she didn't actually spend any time in prison. But someone else did do something like that. Nothing to the degree of what O'Brien did, though. And it turned out that she had some real mental health issues, which is probably not a surprise. And I think that's one of the reasons that the police did not throw the book at her. Like the, you know, she handed out these these ant traps, but no one, no one actually would have eaten them. They were very clearly ant traps. <laughs> so just a weird little event that happened in Long Island and helped to sort of spur this this urban legend that's growing bigger and bigger that Ronald is eventually going to tap into when he commits his own crime. And there's one other case that might sound like something like the O'Brien case, but you'll see that it doesn't even begin to touch the O'Brien case. In 1970, five-year-old Kevin Tostin died of a heroin overdose. Devastating. And when his Halloween candy was investigated, it was found to have been sprinkled with heroin. But police investigation revealed that 
Kevin had gotten into his uncle's heroin stash and accidentally poisoned himself. The family then sprinkled heroin on the candy to try and throw off the police, lest they all get in trouble because there was heroin around this child. Terrible. By the way, for this is going to be like a John Bonet callback for those who think that the parents maybe found John Bonet dead and then tried to cover it up. In this instance, like the, they did had nothing to do with the child, like manipulating him or anything like that. They did something really stupid, sprinkling heroin on his candy, because I don't even think that's the way you would ingest the heroin to be able to overdose. So I think the police were already on them to begin with. It was very stupid of them to do that. And I can't imagine trying to cover up the investigation for your child's death. I guess it would be less bad if they knew why he died, which was that he got into his uncle's heroin stash. But it sounds very stupid and, and not thought out at all. But they did not have anything to do with Kevin getting into the stash, Kevin dying, not rendering aid when he was overdosed and dead. They just didn't want to get into more trouble, I guess, with CPS coming. See, the police would have known this was some sort of hoax because no one's going to like take their drugs and sprinkle it on kids candy. I mean, there's just, you know, it's people don't, precious. People, exactly. People don't typically just give their drugs away. That's not the kind of thing you do. And whenever you see those stories about like they're giving kids acid, no, they're not. Cause they would want to, they would want to take the acid themselves. Like no prank is worth however much it would cost <laughs> for the heroin or the acid. And this was, look, this was not the last time this happened, as we're going to talk about. But after the O'Brien case, even though it turned out to be his dad, people lost their minds. They went absolutely crazy. Hospitals started offering to x-ray candy. Public service announcements ran every year. States passed specific laws with enhanced penalties for poisoning candy. Some communities canceled Halloween altogether. In 1988, the New York Times reported that strychnine had been found in candy in New Jersey. Upon further investigation, it turned out to be cornstarch. Yes, not strychnine. But these are the kind of stories that are going to get people inflamed. You know, right now, every Halloween, now that I think about it, this last Halloween, now that we have like kids you know, old enough to go trick-or-treating, we still get an invitation to go trick-or-treat at the sheriff's office downtown because of fears of poisoned candy. I mean, that exists really because it's a safe place to get your candy and know where the candy came from. And so this really persists into 2023, really because of all of this fear. And, and this case obviously fed into it as well, even though this was not a stranger danger situation. In 1983, the National Confectioners Association decided to establish a hotline to report tampering with Halloween candy. And in all the years, that this hotline ran. There was never a single reported example of a random piece of candy being poisoned or tampered with. So they're trying to nip this in the bud. We're going to give you a hotline. Nobody ever called the hotline. Or if they did, it was never a confirmed instance of actual tampering. So, you know, the lesson I think you can take away from this is don't look Halloween's great. It's a lot of fun. Don't get caught up in, in this stuff. Check your candy. That's fine. This is just hysteria. Be safe, but this is hysteria. There aren't people out there. There aren't Satanists out there poisoning your children's candy with strychnine or anything else and, and murdering them. This case has caused a lot of that hysteria. But remember at the end of the day, this is nothing extraordinary, really. It is a person murdering someone else for money. That's what it was. They chose to tap into this, into Halloween, and to use it. And it has been something that has horrified people ever since. But it is not probably something that you actually have to worry about. Now, one interesting thing. At one point, O'Brien's execution date was actually scheduled to occur on Halloween. But, like most executions, it was delayed, and as we said, he was not eventually executed on Halloween, though that would have been some poetic justice. Well, that's a sad start to yeah, our October yeah. cases. Sorry. But, as I've said, you know, October, this is true crime in its purest form. 
and you know a father killing his son it's a it's a horrible thing and it just so happens that it happened on halloween but that's just you know that that was his clever way to try and cover it up and we talk about <laughs> premeditation sometime i mean you talk about evidence of premeditation the fact that he was so tapped into this how from he was going to do this how he was going to pull it off yeah from january i mean he was planning this the whole time he's upping his insurance in september and then halloween comes and he is he is ready to act Look. you know honestly to be smart I, I know we've talked about how he's not smart and not all premeditated murders are premeditated in a smart way but what he should have done is waited a couple months because a lot of kids keep their candy around for a while forget truly forget even the other children forget where the candy came from it would be a lot harder to trace if you're three weeks out four weeks out and around thanksgiving like where did that pixie stick even come from did it even come from halloween or did it come from many different ways that a kid can get candy from school treasure box a kid on the playground that would have been much smarter. But no, he was impatient. And that's what's so devastating about this case. Literally not another day could pass. His his daughter didn't want to eat candy. He was forcing candy on his children because he needed to collect money ASAP. And not a couple weeks could pass by. I mean, truly, yeah. this is a monster, right? You wonder how upset he was that his daughter wouldn't eat the candy. That, was, that halved his take home. Yeah. It truly did. And that is just... So sad. And here, here's also why it was stupid of him to not wait. If his son wanted it and his daughter didn't, you're not going to get a second shot at this. She's not going to then be able to eat the candy and die later. So he's already halved his take home. If I were him and you wanted to be smart about it, you say, Timothy, you know what? It's late. Let's all go to sleep and we'll have our treat in the morning. And then in the morning, make them both eat it. Because if they died at the same time, no one could intervene in order to stop, you know, the murders. The problem is you're not evil enough, Alice, because in addition to killing his own kids, he was going to kill three other kids to cover it up, right? Like those kids were going to die too, so that it was, you know, it covered up the murder. You couldn't trace it. So they had to die that night. They did. He did like the five, like the five people closest to him, though, (laughs) which is so stupid. (laughs) Anyways, we've talked enough about the stupidity. It's more the anger that's coming out because. He's not it was it was truly just for money. It wasn't even anything special. It wasn't a a devastating custody battle. It wasn't that his son, you know, needed a lot of services and he didn't have the money to pay for it. It was nothing like that. It was just his failure at life that caused his son to die. Well, look, I'm not going to say I hope you enjoyed this one because it's not very enjoyable, but I am interested to hear from you guys about your experience with Halloween and trick-or-treating and checking your candy. And and I'm sure there's so many out there, so many of you out there who were saying, well, they say it never happened, but I knew a kid whose brother's cousin found a razor blade in his Snickers bar. So there you go. And those are probably the kind of stories that we're going to get. But I would love to hear your story of all the adulterated candy that happened in your community and how you you know there was some kid who was poisoned down the street and they never found the murderer because they probably were a member of some sort of satanic organization that was murdering children. But send us those stories. We'll relay them at a later date. Prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Hello to those of you watching on YouTube. And so happy to have so many people joining us tonight live to hear this really sad story. This great October story that we're actually recording in September. For all of them, Halloween is starting early. They are so lucky. Well, Alice, do you want to answer a question to try and lighten the mood as we sail off? Always. Okay, let's see. We got so many questions lately. We should answer some some of these. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Alice, this one is directed at you, but I'm going to answer it as well. So, <laughs> you know, though I can't answer the specific question, but I'm going to answer it with my own answer. <laughs> All okay. Right. This is from KB Audit This. And KB wants to know, when you were at Yale, what was your favorite pizza place in New Haven? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. So those of you who don't know, New Haven is like, you know, the pizza debate of Pepe's versus Sally's. But there's also like other great pizza places like bar pizza. And apparently the hamburger was invented there. Louis hamburger. And like you get yelled at if you ask for ketchup or tomatoes or lettuce. I'm getting on a tangent. But between Pepe's and Sally's, I was always the Pepe's girl. And so the last time we went up to New Haven, I took my kids to both Pepe's and Sally's to see which one they would go for. 
no surprise that my five-year-old refused all pizza <laughs> and ate lentils <laughs> and my three-year-old ate every pizza in sight. And he said, mm, I love Pepe Sales. I think he thinks they're the same thing. <laughs> So I'm a Pepe's girl. But if you go to New Haven, I mean, you obviously have to have clam pizza. It's delicious. And mashed potato pizza at bar pizza is also fantastic. None of these are healthy, but who's trying to be healthy here? Was Yankee Doodles still open when you were there or had had it closed? Is that a bar? Clearly it was not open, I guess. (laughs) I mean, it was a restaurant. It was famous Ah. and... New Haven, but it closed. I don't it closed I remember sometime ever after going I went. It. Then yeah. it probably was closed. It closed in 2008. So you would have been. I got there in 2008. Wow. Just yeah, missed you it. You just missed it. You I just literally missed ju- it. I got there fall of 2008. Yeah, Is it that closed right? in January 2008. Am I that old? Okay. Oh, missed it by nine months. Yeah, you did. It was great. It was a great place. They had great, okay. donuts. They had oh. great donuts. I don't know how their pizza was, but donuts were great. Okay, there, so, there's great food there. Okay, what's your favorite pizza? Well, when I was at Harvard, I don't know that I had a favorite pizza place, but there was this place right next no, to the No, you have to pick New Haven pizza. Everyone's here for the New Haven pizza. Well, I don't know anything about New Haven pizza. I didn't go to Yale. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't have that. I just went Talk to Yankee Doodles. Harvard. One of the times I went to see Harvard beat Yale in the game. I stopped by Yankee Doodles because it was famous and I had it. Anyway, Alice, when I was at the law school, there was a place called Three Aces. It's since closed, unfortunately, because the law school took over the building it was in. And Three Aces was like, if you went to Harvard Law School before Three Aces closed, it basically got you through at least one L year, maybe all three years there. And man, it was it was like it was a combination of like Greek food and Italian food. And so they had like great like Greek food, but also good pizza i'm not gonna say it was great pizza it was good pizza <laughs> and then like ravioli and all that stuff it was great it was great that's gonna be mine so anybody from delicious. cambridge okay. will know what i'm talking so, about so i didn't know that mashed potato pizza i forget that other people may not have mashed potato pizza before mashed potato pizza is actually not at pepe's or sally's which is the historical pizza debate for those of you who may be like totally one it is as amazing as it sounds I don't know how to describe it. I don't think there's even cheese on it. I'm sure there's cheese on it. I think it's just a glob of butter. It's like mashed potatoes, like like an inch, maybe two inches of just like creamy mashed potatoes with bacon bits stuffed in it and on a pizza crust. And it's oven baked or, yeah, stone fire, stone fire, whatever baked. And it is delicious. It is, I mean, it is mm absolutely amazing we've talked about our comfort foods mashed potatoes being one of them mashed potatoes on pizza is like creme de la creme i was at a pizza place a few weeks ago about a week ago and somebody ordered a pizza no cheese with broccoli (laughs) and i was like wow (laughs) so like a frittata (laughs) yeah i mean i guess it was pizza were they trying to get like (laughs) They were trying to start a brawl. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you people get upset about pineapple. I mean, that was like... <gasps> oh, my goodness. Wow. That's really funny. That's really, really funny. Okay, I'm going to answer one more for tonight. This one's directed at me, and Alice will have no answers for this. This is from W.A. Islander, and they ask, with spooky season around the corner, perfect time for us to do this, I would love some horror movie recommendations. So, obviously, for this episode, we're going to watch Trick or Treat, which is an amazing movie. Amazing movie. One of the best movies ever made about Halloween. And it's set on Halloween night. Great movie. Obviously, the original Halloween is fantastic, too. Okay, so movies that you may not have seen. Session 9, which I recommend to everyone, is one of the best horror movies ever made. It's a low-budget horror movie. It is set at an abandoned insane asylum in Massachusetts, which has since been converted into condominiums. I kid you not. It was actually the basis for Arkham Asylum in the Batman comics. was based on this place. It's called Danvers. And Danvers State Hospital. It's set there. It is an amazing movie. You got to watch it. It is incredible. Session 9. Check it out. It will freak you out. I promise you. Some other good movies recently. I mean, I really like The Babadook. I thought The Babadook was great. I like, you know, I really like Midsummer, Midsummer, however you pronounce it. But it doesn't really strike me as a Halloween movie because it's like a summer horror movie. The whole thing takes place 
in the daylight. So I don't know if that works for for a horror movie or for a Halloween horror movie or not. Cabin in the Woods, amazing. Another movie I like to watch and watch often. Fantastic movie. One of the best horror movies ever made. Nightmare on Elm Street is one of my all-time favorites. The original. Look, there are parts of it that are dated, but it is really holds up well. And let's see, what else? There's so many. There are so I'm many. I'm not gonna lie, options. I don't like the words coming out of your mouth mean nothing to me. I don't know what these movies are. I've never seen them. I will never see them. I'm not gonna Google them. I know. Tell I know me I'm else. not alone. And it makes me sad. It makes me sad. <laughs> Does, Evil Dead, you... fantastic. No. Great movie. How do you have so many movies at your fingertips? Oh, I mean, look, I've I've seen so many horror movies. I, the problem the problem is not that I don't have any; it's that I have so many in my head that it's hard to even narrow them down into like a few just incredible movies. I mean, look, I really like the Blair Witch Project. It was good at the time. It was so groundbreaking, and and you kids today just don't understand because you guys grew up with found footage, and there's some great found footage movies, but like the remake of Dawn of the Dead. Really good. If you like zombie movies, that's a good one. Obviously, 28 Days Later, if you like zombie movies. It's like, it all depends on like the kind of movie. Like, What are you looking for? When a Stranger Calls, really good. And sort of based on the Manson murders. So if you want to like connect it to true crime, there's always that. But yeah, I mean, there's lots of great movies. And somebody mentioned The Exorcist in the chat. You know, The Exorcist to me was just okay. I was kind of disappointed in it. Oh, shoot. Okay. And, and look. And I don't care. You can judge me for this if you want to. I don't care. <laughs> the scariest movie I've ever seen is The Ring. The Ring is the scariest movie I've ever seen. I've seen it one time. Don't describe it, please. In the movie theaters. And it just, it just like, I don't know. It haunted me for so long. And I don't even know if it works anymore because it's all about a, a haunted videotape. So I don't know if it works anymore because who People uses be like, VCRs anymore? a videotape? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was like, whew, just like. Ah, really really good terrifying I, mean, I don't know if it's any good now but like at the time in the movie theaters when it came out amazing just amazing and the video the video to this day is still super no, creepy like no, if you just watch the video I don't want really to I don't want to talk about it <laughs> while we're doing this I do want to let's see if I can so one thing I like to do one thing I really enjoy and the problem with a lot of horror movies is they're too long so, you know, horror movies are all about the idea, really. And usually the idea, if you have an idea for a great horror movie, it keeps you invested for the first 60 minutes. 90 minutes is about the perfect time for a horror movie. The first 60 minutes are amazing. And then you got to wrap it up and it kind of falls apart, right? I mean, we've all been there. You know, the monster's really creepy until you see the monster and then you're like, eh. Not that great. So one thing that's really good in my view are short shorts, horror shorts. So things that are like 20 minutes long and people make a lot of these. There's a lot of independent things. And, and sorry, those of you out there who don't care about horror, I mean, you can just turn off the podcast because I could talk about this forever. But I do want to suggest a couple of these horror movie shorts because I have some that I am really into. <laughs> I'm going to do like a reading of Little Women in our November episodes. <laughs> you should do that. That that sounds wonderful. Okay, so there was, I'm going to give you some shorts. One of them is called Cargo, and it was so good that they made it into a full-length movie. But if you can find the short version of it, it's really fantastic. It's called Cargo. It's great. There's another one called The Jigsaw, which is which I really love. And it kind of combines a whole bunch of horror tropes together. All these are really short. I mean, we're talking five to 10 minutes. Like you can watch these very quickly. So check that out. The Birch. The Birch is great. And it became sort of a viral sensation when it came out. So you may actually have seen it. But if you haven't seen it, go find it. There's one called Don't Move, which is all about what happens when you mess around with a Ouija board and things go wrong. Really good as well. And then my favorite horror short, which is so good. And I could watch it over and over and over again. And I have. And every time you watch it, you will notice something new. It's called The Facts in the Case of Mr. Hollow. The Facts in the Case of Mr. Hollow. 
Absolutely amazing. One of the best horror shorts ever. You got to check it out. You will enjoy it. And, you know, I'll probably suggest other good horror movies as the month continues. But that's enough to get you started. That should get you through next week. So next week, we'll have more what, horror do movies. do people not have jobs or families? <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know what kind of life you lead, Brett. <laughs> the Ritual, that was a good horror movie that came out recently. So. I feel vindicated that, like, at least five people have dropped off the live since you've been talking about <laughs> horror movies. Only five people, but those five people are my people. Yeah, yeah. Hell House, LLC, another great movie. And in fact, is a trilogy, and all three of them are good. And I recommend all three of those movies. You'll enjoy this. Okay, that's enough. Sorry, guys. Like I said, I get excited when it's, when it's October. So, you know, those of you who always say you listen to us read the phone book, we are putting you to the test. Find out whether or not it's true. Alice, is there anything else you want to add? Your favorite horror movie, perhaps? No, nope, no, nope. can listen to absolutely it. not. No horror movies over here. But thanks for ending it on that because I do know a lot of people love your horror movie recommendations. Y'all have fun watching a horror movie trick or treat with Brett this Friday. I will not be there. I might start watching Christmas movies in protest. Mm. Mm. Well, there you go. You guys can watch Christmas movies with Alice. Santa's sleigh. <laughs> Santa's. I see what you did there. There I got you. I got (laughs) you. Okay, guys. We'll be back next week with another story plucked from October. But I promise you it'll be true crime just like this one was. As we always say, just because it happens in October doesn't mean it's not true crime. So I hope you guys will check it out. Until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. my sounds okay i'm really sorry you sound great to me okay i'm glad because i i'm not kidding you my podcast equipment was like in eight parts it was like the grim reaper in here and i was like trying to find it okay oh i gotta get a word for you don't i i just always forget it's like we've been doing this for so long you think i would have it down but i don't you think you would but i don't i don't have it kind of weird to like be back on a live because I'm like I literally okay I realized I never knew how many people were watching because I wasn't signed in like now I'm signed in so I can mm-hmm. see it. So I really actually never knew how many people were watching and in my mind I still think that like three people listen to us like our spouses and maybe one extra person and so it still boggles my Jason. mind that anybody listens to us and Jason yeah. <laughs> and Jason <laughs> Summer on Pluto TV featuring hit blockbusters during popcorn summer movies. 
Watch Mark Wahlberg try and solve a murder in Four Brothers. Or go on an adventure with an Indiana Jones movie marathon. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies. Available live and on demand.